Uh, welcome everybody to this month's TEMS webinar. So today we are very happy to welcome Haruko Wainwright as our uh, webinar speaker. So Haruko is an assistant professor at MIT. She has uh, joined appointments at the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering and the Department of uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering. Um, her expertise is in nuclear engineering, uh, and she's especially uh, interested in environmental model modeling and monitoring of nuclear waste and nuclear contaminants. And she has done a lot of pioneering work on new uh, monitoring technologies for monitoring nuclear contaminants. And also what is especially of interest to us is that she has worked on new statistical data analysis methods for uh, monitoring uh, nuclear uh, contaminants. Um, uh, she holds uh, a master's degree both in nuclear engineering and also in statistics from, from Berkeley, and also a PhD de degree in nuclear engineering from, from Berkeley as well. Um, after she obtained her PhD, she uh, she joined the uh, Berkeley lab as a as a staff scientist and was there for several years until uh, recently moving to to MIT as a faculty member. Uh, so so she will be talking about her work on uh, uh, kind of the statistical aspects of of, of nuclear uh, monitoring uh, today. And uh, with that, we can get started. So uh, Haruko, if you can share your slides, and then you can uh, get started whenever whenever you're ready. Thank you for the introduction. I will share my uh, screen. Um, can you okay. see my screen? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So um, today I will talk about the um, more sort of broader sort of environmental science aspect and how we can apply machine learning AI for environmental monitoring. A uh, particular topic is the intersection between simulations and machine learning AI, someone calls simulation intelligence. We are uh, aiming to build the new paradigm of environmental monitoring. So I work on nuclear specific uh, contamination, but I also work more broad uh, sort of groundwater contamination. Uh, it is a widespread environmental problem across the world. Within the US, uh, there are more than 1,000 so-called Superfund sites. That's a large-scale contamination. It can be organic. It could be metal or radioactive uh, contamination. In addition, there are more than 400,000 so-called brownfield sites that have so some sort of contamination. Uh, often, these are major environmental justice issues since they are often associated with low-income disadvantaged communities. So U.S. has 30, 40 year history of cleanup and remediation, uh, but we are finding out that it is challenging to, challenging to remediate low concentration and large volume plume because at low concentration, uh, the treatment is no longer effective, but we can't remove all the soil. Uh, the environmental remediation cleanup is evolving over the past decade. Uh, environmental remediation cleanup itself is kind of new, my age, 40 year old. It started in 80s after all the environmental regulations were established. Uh, now uh, people are recognizing that we are transitioning from intensive treatment to sustainable treatment. Uh, there is actually an industry forum called Sustainable Remediation Forum. Uh, because people are recognizing that cleanup is not clean, actually. Uh, we have to evaluate the trade-off. For example, uh, cleanup creates a lot of waste, CO2, and cleanup itself actually has an ecological impact and it could cause uh, air pollution issues. So uh, here is sort of some typical cleanup. Looks like this. There's a heavy machineries that could produce air pollution, or you can see that they could have a ecological impact. So we are transitioning to sustainable methods that try to minimize waste pollution, energy water use, and ecological damages. Uh, so uh, sustainable remediation uses uh, biodegradation, in situ immobilization, and if there is no impact to public health right now and the future, uh, we can use monitor natural attenuation. Uh, this means that um, uh, these sites will have longer institutional control, uh, but we can come up with alternative and attractive end use. For example, we can put solar panels without disturbing the soil, or we can have uh, ecological park, 
and that requires long-term monitoring, monitoring to make sure that these residual contaminants are stable. Environmental monitoring is really an exciting time right now, as some of you know. In our science, because of new technologies, we have drones, uh, satellite, airborne data set. In the subsurface, we have in situ uh, sensors at low cost or subsurface imaging uh, for groundwater. The key algorithm development is to uh, integrate multi-type, multi-scale data sets that have different accuracy, coverage, and footprint and a solution. Uh, we can take advantage of proxy information. For example, plant types and topography are often good proxy for soil properties. Uh, electrical conductivity can be a good proxy for contaminant concentration. You can imagine machine learning could be very effective here. And we can also take advantage of uh, spatial temporal correlation as well. There are challenges in machine learning and AI and environmental science. Uh, lack of training data set is combined with large uncertainty or natural fluctuation that cannot be explained easily. Also, uh, the scale of heter heterogeneity is often multi-scale. Uh, here is the value gram as a function of separation scale. So basically, it is saying that if you look at bigger domain, we find bigger heterogeneity. So someone called fractal, for example. Um, and also, we encountered many, that, many data sets that look really big, but actually don't have so much information because of correlation. For example, this is the wind field. Uh, from weather simulation, this is a 100 by 100 grid points, but it can compress to 10 principal components, for example. Um, in parallel, model and simulation capabilities are rapidly evolving. Uh, weather for forecasting is, of course, now more reliable and extensively used. Uh, but long term, long term, long term simulation prediction are still challenging like global climate models, for example, watershed scale model for the next, let's say, 10, 20 years, or contaminant transport model. Uh, the challenge is particularly for subsurface, subsurface model is particularly uh, subsurface heterogeneity, um, par parameterization, um, or these large models are still very hard to run, or it takes a long time to run. So based on these te new technologies, now I'm co-leading a project called Advanced Long-Term Long -term Environmental Monitoring System Project, Optimist Project. This is funded by US Department of Energy. Uh, our goal is to establish the new paradigm of long-term environmental monitoring through the integration of these three components, new sensing technologies that I mentioned, model simulations, and machine learning and AI. Uh, this is a large interdisciplinary project. It includes AI machine learning staff, experts, uh, simulation people, geophysics team for characterization, um, and also geochemical geochemists for fundamental understanding. One of the biggest development, development items is in situ re real time groundwater monitoring approach. So these days there are local sensors, in situ sensors that can measure several variables like water table, pH, and specific conductance. Specific conductance is basically the electrical conductivity of the water. Um, and we often see good correlation, let's say specific contaminant, specific conductance and contaminant concentration. In this case, this is a uranium concentration. Uh, we often see that at mining sites and nuclear waste sites, uh, for example. So based on this relationship, we can estimate contaminant concentrations uh, in real time. Uh, this system allows us to monitor uh, continuously over time and we can detect changes quickly and we can reduce monitoring costs because we can reduce manual sampling and lab analysis. Um, we demonstrated the concept first with historical data set. Um, 
Here, the goal is to estimate contaminant concentration, let's say uranium groundwater contamina contamination concentration based on in situ variables, in, in situ measurable variables, in this case, specific conductance and pH. And we assume that we have continuous measurements of these and sample, sampling data set occasionally. And we have the a state, state, state space model for describing the time evolution. Uh, next time step of the contaminant concentration is a function of previous time step. We also have a relationship between contaminant concentrations and in situ sensor variables. And in this case, we apply common filter. We can estimate the contaminant concentration. So the red line is the mean field, mean line, mean estimation, uh, blue lines were contaminant concentration not used in the estimation. So we can see that the mean line can capture the uh, uh, measurements, including these bumps. And we have the confidence interval to quantify uncertainty. Um, we have also shown that we can reduce the number of groundwater sampling, uh, manual measurements from every quarters to every two years. So we can save uh, money for that. Um, this work was published in 2018. It got a lot of attention. It was kind of refreshing to see that people are interested in environmental uh, applications of machine learning AI, statistical method. Um, and this paper pushed the site managers to actually install sensors it took five, three years because of all the regulations, but we just installed it this year. For the meantime, we have expanded the functionality of these algorithms and developed an open source Python package called PyLAM. We are developing a software framework to facilitate the application of machine learning to long-term groundwater data sets at the site scale. So this framework, include various functions from pre-processing, exploratory data analysis to unsupervised learning, uh, identify different correlations, identify different groups of wells that behave similarly. Uh, clustering basically uh, and supervised learning is basically the spatial temporal interpolation and optimization is how we can uh, place sensors or how we can uh, place uh, wells, groundwater wells. Uh, for example, supervised learning is a uh, spatial interpretation. Uh, let's say we want to map the groundwater table. We cannot see it in the surface. We sample at these points, but we know that elevation is a good proxy for groundwater table. So we can combine uh, these point measurements and elevation as a proxy, and we can estimate groundwater table uh, much more accurately. Also, we, we see this uh, contaminant concentration, in this case, tritium, have a good correlation with specific conductance. We can measure in situ, so we can map this contaminant concentration over the space uh, uh, based on this in situ measurable of variables. Uh, we also have implemented the well optimization algorithm. In this case, we have so many wells at this site. We have more than 100 wells, and we want to reduce the number of wells more effectively. So this is based on greedy algorithm. So we, we know the reference map uh, using the full data set, and we can sort of place the well that captures the heterogeneity. Um, it works kind of more like a more like a human intuition. Uh, the algorithm placed the wells uh, along the gradient in this case for the groundwater table, and then uh, spread in the, in the region around and put in between. So you can sort of see uh, how error uh, overall estimation error goes down as a function of number of wells. And we can evaluate how many how many wells are enough. Let's say maybe 20 wells could be enough to capture the spatial heterogeneity in this case. So we just installed the sensors after 
uh, communication with the regulators and the site managers. Uh, we are very excited. We installed uh, 20 or so sensors. Um, we are currently developing web interface. Uh, we can look at the data set every day and we can uh, create the interpolation map or we can explore different number of wells um, to potentially to reduce the number of wells in the future. Uh, in parallel, we are pushing the boundary of contaminant transport modeling and the use of modeling and simulations. Uh, we are using new software called Amanzi that is that has been developed by Department of Energy. Uh, this code is optimized to use on a supercomputer. Um, it can accommodate million grid blocks or even more. So Amanzi itself solves flow and transport uh, uh, PDE uh, based on mimetic finite element method and it coupled with chemistry engine to uh, represent the uh, mobility of element. Um, it is a flexible interface that can couple with different chemistry engines depending on the problems. So uh, this software, for example, can accommodate complex uh, reactions of uranium. Uranium can attach to the rock surface or it can create different complexes. Um, we can include all these reactions. So here is a, a 3D uh, simulation of uranium transport. Here is the source zone. Once the plume hits the groundwater, it spreads in the groundwater. And uh, now the clean water comes from the upstream, so it kind of washes out the uh, rhenium, but you kind of see that there is a significant amount of residual contaminants above the groundwater table. We call it unsaturated zone, beta zone, and some residual contaminants in the clay zone as well. Uh, so this has been very helpful for understanding, let's say, the uh, climate change impact on contamination. Uh, but I have, to say, I have to say that it's very uh, computationally heavy. Uh, for uncertainty quantification, we can pro we can do like several hundred of simulations for uncertainty quantification, but not like thousand simulation. And also, it's very hard to fit all the data points when we have let's say twenty or so uh, monitoring wells. So uh, using this simulation capability, I demonstrate this intersection between simulation and machine learning AI. Uh, people call it simulation inter intelligence. I participated in this big paper that collected a lot of application, even from um, economics. Uh, it, I think it's a very exciting area. Uh, so here, uh, I show two applications. One application is to evaluate quantitatively the qu climate change impact on groundwater contamination. We are developing an emulator using Fourier neural operators. This is in collaboration with NASA Frontier Development Lab. The second one is a physics informed interpretation. Uh, in addition to sparse measurements, we can integrate the simulation. Uh, product. Uh, we are developing Bayesian hierarchical model with uh, Gaussian process models. So the climate change impact on contamination is an emerging topic. We know that extreme, extreme precipitation is happening more often or the precipitation trend is shifting and many parts of US, particularly in the east, eastern part of the US, is expecting more precipitation, increasing precipitation in the future. So higher precipitation into the ground could remobilize residual contaminants. At the same time, more water means more dilution. So it could dilute the concentration. So it, this, these are competing effects. We have to evaluate quantitatively. And the site managers have these questions. Should we change management strategies or should we change monitoring well configurations? Ideally, it would be nice to have this sort of tools, 
let's say we can explore different scenarios like dry to wet uh, because climate scenarios or climate projections have a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we also have to account uncertainty in the subsurface properties. Let's say some of the parameters are uncertain. But the challenge is, again, the computation is pretty heavy. We cannot run simulations on laptop. So then we use emulators or surrogate modeling approaches. I assume that many people know it, but just in case. Uh, so we, in this process, we first generate um, parameters, uh, the parameter vector from the PDF. P in this case is the parameter. Here are the bunch of parameter sets and we run simulations. So we have ensemble of uh, simulation results. Uh, phi is the output. And based on this um, output and input data sets, we run regressions. It can be linear regression or it could be random forest or different regression methods. Then once we have this relationship established, we can just use this a regression model without running simulation. So if you are interested in particular parameters between these um, generated sets, we can still get the predictions. So the emulator is the statistical representation of the physical models to relate output to input parameters uh, statistically without running simulations. So in our case, we can run all the simulations, uh, run regression on the clusters or um, supercomputers, and we can just use emulator on the laptop for the decision making. So our model is based on the contaminant transport model at one of the DOE sites. Uh, in this case, we have a 2D vertical cross section of the site. Uh, it can run faster. In this case, we had a thousand simulation. Um, there are, we have seven input parameters that are uncertain. We have some flow parameters. Uh, we also have source uncertainty, source concentration of the contaminant. Um, I would say that there, there used to be a space in that discharged um, loadable loadable radioactive solutions so that contaminant kind of spread from here to the groundwater. Uh, we also have this time varying recharge. Recharge is basically precipitation minus evapotranspiration, how much water goes into the groundwater. And that's basically is the dependent variable on the climate change. So we have different uh, recharge value, uh, historical, mid-century, and late century values. So as an emulator, we are using a unit enhanced Fourier neural operator architecture, which is known to be well suited for emulating the solution of partial differential equations. Um, so here's the input of all the subsurface climate parameters and the output is the temporal evolution of the contaminant concentrations. So the UFNO architecture involved the Fourier layer, Fourier transform, uh, followed by adding weights and biases and transforming back to the original domain. Um, we also added unit. This is the basic data convolution neural network. I would say intuitively it accounts the spatial correlation and spatial structure so that we can improve the accuracy. So we, um, for loss function, we added uh, physical constraints in our loss function. Uh, first, we have this prediction error, mean relative error, and also derivatives. So the deriv derivatives, uh, spatial derivatives um, represent the contaminant flux and velocity. That's also very important. We also added the contaminant boundary. So this is the uh, plume extent. Um, we have to capture this boundary and also the no flow boundary in the simulation so that that's the physical constraint. Uh, we also consider two different architectures. One is the full time series input and output. Um, 
So in this case, all the time series are like kind of video, uh, movie, in and out. And also the second one is the recurrent version. So in this recurrent um, version, basically each time step we do prediction. So the, uh, cut the next time step of the contaminant distribution, contaminant concentration is a function of last time step and other input parameters. And we do the estimation at each time step. Computationally, this is a little bit lightweight, although we have to do um, each time step, all the time steps. So here is the uh, Bloom prediction. So the prediction here is from the emulator. Um, this is actually not included in the estimation. It, I would say it's a predicting unseen data set. This is the ground truth from the simulation. So you can sort of see that uh, it's pretty almost identical. Uh, here is the difference. Difference often happens at the plume boundary, but we show that it's a less than 5%. So we can demonstrate the offline assessment of climate change impact on the plume how this plume, plume or the contaminant concentration, in this case, yellow is high, sorry, I should have noted, noted uh, how it depends on different recharge values. So uh, at, here is the low recharge, low precipitation, and here it goes higher. And basically, um, high recharge kind of pushes the contaminant plume forward, and it can dilute but also you can still sort of see in the difference that some part becomes higher concentration uh, due to remobiliz remobilization of the contaminants from the source. And there is a dilution is this blue part. So basically the dilution and remobilization can happen at the same time within the site. And it's important to have the distributed wells to capture these competing effects when we do monitoring. Uh, we also explore the impact of different loss, loss functions and architectures. So this B is kind of adding sort of the boundary conditions. Uh, here is more, as you go down in this table, uh, there are more uh, loss terms in this uh, loss function, more terms in the loss function, sorry. So in general, we can say that as we add more loss terms, uh, the accuracy of emulator improves in terms of MRE and MSE. Um, and we also compared the two architecture recurrent and full time series. So the full time series is has less error. It's more accurate. Uh, in terms of the accuracy, FNOB, the full architecture is better than recurrent one. I think this is common across many of the environmental data set. Neural network doesn't care about physics. It's better just to put all the data sets without physics. Um, I have heard this kind of thing from other colleagues as well. But in the climate assessment concept context, interesting thing could happen. For example, let's say we change the precipitation, mid-century precipitation, between 2020 and 2060. So uh, this is the busy figure. So we have two architecture. So this is the full version, full data set, and the bottom is the recurrent version. And here is the 1985 result plume, plume, and this is the 2025 contaminant concentration. Uh, we changed the recharge value, more, more rain as you go down. So, of course, if we change the mid-century precipitation at 2020, it has an impact in 2025. You can sort of see some part is higher than the base case uh, due to remobilization. There is a lower part uh, due to um, dilution. But it, it's kind of interesting that the full, full data case, it also has an impact in the past. So um, yeah, if you put all the data set 
um, neural network doesn't care the past or future. So if you change the future variable, it actually has an impact to the past. Uh, he does the past. Um, so I would say that recurrent one is more realistic. So we have started thinking that maybe we need to have a different strategy if we use the full version uh, to account the time dependent parameters. Okay, so we are moving to the second part. Uh, second demonstration is the physics informed spatial and temporal interpolation. Um, so the cont con contaminant concentration uh, sampled at wells or sensors look like this. We drill holes in the ground, we collect samples, or we put the sensors. It's always sparse um, point measurements. I started my career from geostatistics. So I love point measurements, uh, but we can say that, you know, there's a missing physics here that there's a source here in between and the flow direction goes down. If you do si simple interpretation, this physical information is not accounted. And here we have model. It's very hard to fit the actual data set, but it actually has a variable information, flow direction, uh, the source term, and we also have, um, I would say, uncertain data set. Let's say in situ data set is correlated with real contamination concentration uh, with some increased error. So the goal is to integrate these data sets um, all uh, to better, uh, to create a better uh, interpreted map. And in this case, we assume that we have the ensemble simulations of the model. Um, and we take advantage of advances in GP Gaussian process models. Um, my former colleague, uh, Mark Snork, has been advancing GP for um, various applications, including autonomous monitoring, uh, autonomous experiment, experiment, ex sorry, experiment, autonomous experiment. Uh, he has um, build GP for large data set and also the one including non-stationary kernel. I think it's super exciting advances. Uh, so we are collaborating with him. Uh, so for the data integration, we are developing Bayesian hierarchical model. Uh, let's say we have the map. We want to estimate the map of contaminant concentration. Uh, condition on groundwater sampling data set and in situ sensor data set. We want to estimate this posterior distribution. Uh, we have this ensemble simulation um, data set. Let's say that P is um, parameters, subsurface parameters, and phi is the contaminant concentration from simulation. Uh, there is a difference between Y and phi. Actual concentrations are not that simulated ones. And instead of spending two multiple years to calibrating it, we just assume sort of bias and errors of the simulation. And we just create a function that real concentration is a function of simulated concentration and added errors. So I wouldn't say that this would be good for long-term prediction, extrapolation for the next hundred years. Um, I wouldn't say that. I think the application is limited, but at least I would say that this would be great for improving the current interpolation and current mapping of the plume concentration. Uh, so in this case, we describe this function uh, using the Gaussian process model so that the simulation comes in in this trend term of the multivariate normal distribution and we have a uh, spatial correlated covariance. Uh, so the posterior distribution, we can break it down to a uh, smaller distribution. We add these hyperparameters or geostatistics parameters and subsurface parameters. This is the marginal, is the marginal distribution. And we can add uh, the beauty of the Bayesian hierarchical model is that we can break down big distribution into the smaller chunks. So for example, this is uh, first one is the correlation between sensor data set and uh, contaminant concentration. So the con 
this is the well data set as a function of uh, or as a function of contaminant concentration, and this is the GP part that I described in the previous slide. Uh, so we are exploring different uh, sampling scheme for this posterior distribution, uh, given that we have pre-existing pre ensemble simulations. Uh, basically, um, we, we, for example, try um, MCMC as well. This is sort of the sampling resampling scheme. So uh, given the ensemble simulation um, and hy generated hyperparameters, we apply uh, GP and estimate the field map and calculate the likelihood. And we resample the field based on the likelihood for the posterior distribution. And we can calculate the average um, mean field and variance field as well. So here is the demonstration. Here's, I would say, the preliminary, preliminary data set. This is the observed data set of the tritium concentration, uh, one of the radionuclide um, contaminant at this site. Uh, here is the simulated concentration. So you can sort of see here's the plume spreading to the downstream, uh, but there's a bias between observed and simulated, but using the uh, data integration method, we can assimilate. Uh, here is the estimation field. So we can see where is the plume, plume source location. And also here is the uh, spreading downstream. Here is the pathway plume going downstream. We can uh, represent the flow, flow direction. Uh, this is the performance confirmation. Uh, we, we had two wells, two points that were not used in the estimation. Here's the confidence interval. We can capture the data sets in the confidence interval. So um, we can compare the plume extent uh, between the simple interpolation just based on the points and the integrated map. Um, I would say that the integrated map is more realistic capturing the source location and also the plume direction down gradient compared to the simple interpolation. So um, we are developing the pathway to adaptation. Um, I have been in the stochastic hydrology community. There are so many methods, but a lot of them don't get used. But we want uh, sites to use our technologies. Um, it's a challenging and slow process, um, uh, partly because it is a sensitive topic. Um, I envy weather prediction communities or my atmospheric modeling co colleagues because let's say weather prediction fails, you know, that's okay, right? Well, it's fun, like uh, weather prediction fails, that's normal. But I think the failed contaminant transport predictions can lead to legal, legal action. So we have to do a lot of QA, QC of the cores, all the data sets. The development is very slow. Um, and also that we have a lot of extensive regulations, uh, processes of paperwork for new technologies. Uh, that is a uh, dragging, um, as I mentioned, uh, for us to in install sensors, it took three years from original idea. But we found some, we are lucky to find some person, legal expert that understands sort of new technologies, for example. Um, uh, we are learning, for example, that techno regulations are somewhat flexible in one direction, but not the others. For example, reducing sampling frequency is easier. So, okay, that we can work on that first. Uh, then reducing number of variables and reducing number of wells. So we can start from something easier and make impact. Um, and also uh, we are learning that it's important to emphasize additional safety measure uh, using these um, monitoring, in situ monitoring technologies, for example, uh, continuous monitoring allow us to do early warning or explaining anomalies, um, guide monitoring strategies. Um, we don't say we just reduce the cost, right? And 
another thing that kind of set the expectation, right? I think that people think, oh, we are moving to autonomous automated monitoring. I think that's not really true, but we can still use AI to assist the current monitoring methodologies. For example, uh, anomaly detection would be very useful to flag instrument failure, system changes. Um, I think that realistic Bloom visualization would be helpful to um, inform the uh, regulators about real extent of the plume. Um, digital twin, we can talk about sort of this will be useful to predict, let's say, climate change and what can happen in the future. So we are, we are, we have started to, we have started engaging regulators and actual site managers in this process as well. And another direction that we are going is to apply these technologies for future facilities. Let's say nuclear facilities, uh, people are afraid of it and uh, we need to add more safety measures to provide assurance. Um, and we also know that once there is a contamination, it's very hard to clean. So we shouldn't, we should detect any leaks and we should have monitoring before leaks happen. So we are somewhat designing the monitoring um, monitoring framework for future nuclear facilities. Um, I, you can imagine simulations will be more important in this domain because we have to create potential contamination scenarios. Um, last um, five minutes, I would like to talk about a little bit of sort of future or currently developing ideas. Um, when we measure cont contaminant concentration near the big, big sites, big contaminated sites um, in the environmental data sets, we actually find something unexpected. Let's say in the river right next to big contaminated sites, we actually see contaminants or pollutants coming from agriculture, for example, like nit nitrate or uh, pesticide, for example. Um, it, it has been very surprising. And I think this is a kind of important issue. Um, here is sort of depressing fact that they say 94% of water samples in the rivers and 60% of shallow wells in the US now have one, at least one pesticide. Uh, this is because agricultural runoff is often unregulated. And I often, these days, I see a lot of sort of distributed sources, distributed sources, distributed contaminants already spread. Let's say mercury, a um, uh, large part comes from fossil fuel, coal plant um, is now impacting fish. Uh, for example, when I was pregnant, I had to stop eating tuna, for example, or other fish. Um, and microplastic now is a big issue we can find in the ocean, in the soil everywhere, or in our body. Or fluorinated solvent, PFOS, is a big issue as well. And wildfire we have now every year that actually uh, spreading some of the carcinogens or heavy metal as well. So I think that environmental science is so important in this society. Um, I use, when I was young, I really liked this movie. It's called Nausicaa. It's about the future society that doomed with contamination. Um, I feel somewhat depressed um, sometimes. I feel like our, our environment is getting pretty polluted, contaminated, and people don't realize it. And often substance that people don't worry too much end up spreading out widely and impacting our life. So I think that more people, everyone needs to be more aware of these pollution issues and more vigilant to protect our life. And there are many opportunities here. Uh, we have many open data space. For example, we have water quality data set from USGS, air quality from EPA on also purple air. We can download all the remote sensing data sets from uh, Google Earth. And we can do that by one line in the code programming language uh, through API. So 
it, it has been really game changing in the past decade or so. Uh, for example, I applied this physics informed mapping, spatial tempor temporal in interpretation to air quality. So I developed the code to integrate purple air sensor data, EPA air quality sensor data with the plume prediction map from Canada. Um, I have this in an open GitHub base, uh, GP4AQ. Um, please feel free to use if you see some big, big fire in your neighborhood. Um, also, I think that citizen science would be very important. Uh, and there is an opportunity because we have a lot of local sensors. Um, I think if someone is concerned about environment, she or he could should be able to address that in, um, in their own. Um, I'm exploring to develop effective teaching curriculum at the high school level. I participated in the summer program in Alaska. Um, these remote locations, uh, the kids are from uh, rural area of native communities. The educational opportunities are limited, but they have some environmental concerns, for example, mines. And we developed sort of exciting hands-on activities uh, using low-cost water quality sensors, uh, like water matching game, game, which water is which. I also taught statistics, like they measure five times and take the average, for example. Um, and we went out to the outside, collecting water samples, to the measurements or water treatment facilities. Um, and I taught how to analyze these data sets too, um, data science. Uh, so I'm in the, in the process funded by MIT to develop environmental monitoring network in the rural region. Like rural regions don't have a lot of sensor data sets, for example. Uh, we are kind of exploring the high school could be the basis for um, environmental monitoring in the rural region. Um, I'm also hoping that we can sort of increase the interest in environment and climate. Uh, let's say I'm super obsessed about uh, Fitbit and my health. Um, I'm hoping that people can use tech and AI to sort of um, to know to sort of in, to be informed about the environment and climate. The, the challenge is that pollution monitoring is not so exciting when nothing happens. So I'm talking with my students, working with students to come up with some attributes more relevant to daily life. Maybe river temperatures could be useful for fishing. We have many soil moisture sensors that could be used for gardening. We can do short-term forecasting, for example, that could be exciting use of AI machine learning. Um, another challenge that I see is that the students good at math and science are not often interest, not all, not often interested in the environment and climate. I'm at MIT. I see a lot of students just sit in the desk or sit in front of the computer. They don't go outside and they're not super interested in the environment and climate. I, I have a concern. Um, I'm kind of exploring how to put environment in their mind. Um, I'm thinking, can we actually include environmental data sets in more in math and stat statistic ed education, for example? Um, I have so many data sets that can be stat, stat problems. Um, maybe we can develop problem sets, for example. And please let me know if you are interested in this direction. So I will um, end my presentation with this summary. Um, um, long term of monitoring of long term monitoring of soil and ground groundwater contamination is very important for sustainable remediation um, that use long term institutional control and the site with residual contaminants. Uh, we need to have a way to ensure the stability of safety of the contaminated sites. Um, in the Altimist project, we are developing. Uh, many technologies, particularly multi-scale, multi-type data integration. We are developing um, flexible framework um, for uh, groundwater contamination and soil 
contamination as well. And I showed some of the examples of the simulation intelligence. One example is UFNO for emula emulating simulation for evaluating climate change impact. Another one is uh, Bayesian hierarchical model with Gaussian process model for a physics informed spatial, spatial interpretation. We could say physics informed monitoring. And um, I believe that uh, democratizing environmental science is very important in this society. And there are a lot of opportunities for machine learning and AI coupled with new sensor technologies. I'm exploring citizen science for water air quality, um, uh, tackling also environmental justice issues as well. Okay, thank you so much for having me here and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Haruka.